Welcome to yet another extremely informative, extremely topical and timely emit webinar. Last July, um, President Biden said, quote, we are not going to leave a vacuum in the Middle East to be filled by Russia, China and Iran. Yet all of us woke up Friday to the tectonic ship with an appended world order. Um, the world Pax Americana that we all knew since the end of World War II seemed to be shifting. Uh, as all of you are aware, Beijing announced that they had reached a deal to restore diplomatic relations between Riyadh and Tehran, bringing China out of the domain of pure economics and into that of a major player in the diplomatic realm. This was ex announced exactly one day after an article appeared in the Wall Street Journal specifying what security guarantees Saudi Arabia would expect from the United States in exchange for norm normalizing ties with Israel, including security guarantees, help with the development of its nuclear program, and diversification of its economy away from oil. And then this. All of this suddenly happened while we were all acutely aware that Iran has enriched uranium to 84%, just a hair's breadth away from the 90% purity level necessary for weapons grade uranium, which even Rafali Grossi, the head of the IAEA, had said could not be used for peaceful purposes. And this is after two years of dragged out on again, off again negotiations. Um, where it became apparent to all of us who were paying attention that the Iranians were using the negotiations as a smokescreen and making impossible demands on the Americans. Um, the relationship between Saudi Arabia and Iran was severed back in January of 2016, but really Saudi Arabia and Iran have been enemies probably since the inception of Islam way back in the seventh century when they were rivals as to who are the rightful heirs to the crown. Um, in 2017, Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman said that Iranian leader Ali Khamenei was worse than Hitler. And after the Arab Spring in 2011, Iran backed Shiite rebels in Tehran, Houthi rebels in Yemen, Bashar Assad in his brutal civil war in Syria, and has launched wave after wave after wave of attacks on the Saudi oil infrastructure Aramco, particularly in 2019. How is all of this playing out? Where does this leave Israel and Prime Minister Netanyahu's plans for achieving the crown jewel of his normalization plans with the all important Saudi kingdom? Is this radical change of dynamics more a reflection on the way the Saudis feel about Israel or about their relationship with the Biden administration? And most importantly, is Israel now once again isolated in the Middle East? And how are we to contend with the fact that Iran is gradually making unprecedented gains towards a nuclear bomb, which is something that presidents of both political parties have repeatedly vowed that they would never allow to happen? We cannot possibly be in more capable hands to answer these and other questions than with Rich Goldberg. Rich is a brilliant analyst, a treasured friend of a, of a Met, and a great American. Rich Goldberg is a senior advisor for FTG. He served as director for encountering Iranian weapons of mass de destruction for the prior administration. He was a founding staff director of the House US-China Working Group and was among the first Americans ever to visit China's Human Space Launch Center. Rich is a leader in efforts to expand US missile defense cooperation with Israel, and he's played a key role in US funding for the Arrow 3 program, the Iron Dome program, and the development of an advanced missile defense radar in the Negev Desert. He's been a leader in efforts to expand U.S. missile defense cooperation with Israel for years. I first met him as a staffer for Congressman Mark Kirk and then for U.S. Senator Mark Kirk. And Rich has been the chief architect for U.S. strategy of sanctions against Iran. He's also served as an intelligence officer in the U.S. Naval Reserve. And it is a real privilege and honor to have you back, Rich. So, okay, first, Richard. 
How real is this peace between Iran and Saudi Arabia? To what degree is it a genuine peace uh, besides just an exchange of embassies? Will the Iranians withdraw all their malign forces throughout the region and the world from Lebanon, Syria, Bahrain, and Yemen? And will they pull back on their missile infrastructure? So that's a great question, which is sort of a TBD at the moment. Uh, but I think all signals would, would point to the idea that if this is something similar to the 12 points that Secretary Mike Pompeo had put to the Iranians during the Trump administration, if you recall, maximum pressure uh, under Trump was based on this idea that we were no longer just going to have pressure focused on the nuclear program. We were going to look at all of Iran's threats combined. Uh, money is fungible. We're not just relisting sanctions for one threat to use to fund another threat. Uh, that we needed to have a conversation about all of Iran's malign activities, all the ones you just mentioned, and more, hostage taking, et cetera. And so if we were going to have that kind of approach, uh, we were going to move off of the paradigm of the old Iran nuclear deal, the JCPOA, to do that. Uh, the Biden administration, by the way, has said that they wanted to have that same conversation in different ways. They believe the way to do that was to go back to the old deal relieve all pressure on Iran first, and then suddenly Iran would want to have a conversation about other malign activities. Obviously, we disagreed with that. I disagreed with that. Uh, and in fact, their goal has not been achieved. Um, so what, what do we have here in, in this agreement? A, a lot has happened in the last two years, right? Um, it, it's very stunning, I think, to people who have heard and listened to the interviews or read the interviews that you were referencing of Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, speaking as he has for several years about the nature of the Islamic Republic, the root cause of evil and, and uh, instability in the Middle East being the Islamic Republic of Iran, um, his entire thesis of counter extremism in the kingdom has to do with an anti-Iran message uh, going back to 1979 and, and not just the Islamic revolution in Iran, but uh, the uh, attack and hostage taking uh, at the Grand Mosque uh, and, and the uh, wave of extremist support that followed uh, from the kingdom uh, to try to quell any Wahhabi uh, resistance uh, and attempts to take the throne in, in Saudi Arabia it called it a historic mistake, um, that in fact all of this was ginned up uh, by revolutionism, uh, revolutionary ideology exported uh, by the regime in Tehran and He's focused on countering extremism inside Saudi Arabia, uh, around the Middle East and, and the world, uh, and also, of course, with Iran. And suddenly he's ready to start saying, peace in our time, uh, you know, relations with, with Iran is quite good. Uh, we we want to build a new, new era of uh, bilateral relations. Um, we have the finance minister of, of Saudi Arabia today at a conference, the NBC reported this. Uh, it's on the Reuters wire. Some people probably saw the headline this morning saying, we're ready to start pouring investment into Iran as soon as this agreement moves forward. These are stunning comments right, and real reversals, which I think everybody's sort of like, what just happened? What's going on? Um, a few things to unpack here. Number one, we have been losing the U.S.-Saudi relationship for the last two years. Uh, one could argue it was already on thin ice when the Trump administration had come to office and, and we were working on salvaging the relationship of where it was headed after the Obama administration. Um, there had already been a feeling that the United States was pulling back out of the Middle East, would no longer be a security guarantor for its traditional allies in the Middle East. Um, the Sunni governments in the region had sort of seen the lack of enforcement of a red line in Syria uh, more than 10 years ago, the abandonment of Mubarak in Egypt. Um, there was a real sea change going on during the Arab Spring of a lack of trust already in the United States during the Obama administration. Um, there was a little bit of a reversal, obviously the Iran nuclear deal being sort of the crown jewel of, of that sort of thesis of you're on your own, work for a balance between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Um, go look for security guarantees elsewhere. We're now in an era of reaching out to the Iranians ourselves. We hope you do the same. That reversal and, and outreach to the Saudis came uh, during the Trump administration of saying, no, we, under, we agree with you, Mohammed bin Salman. We agree that the threats of the Middle East are not 
the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, as, as many have said for many years. They are, in fact, the Islamic Republic. If you look at instability in Iraq, in Yemen, in Syria, in Lebanon, in Gaza, in the West Bank, it all has a hand uh, of, of Iran. And it even goes farther than that into Africa, uh, Latin America, uh, right on our border as well. And so we want to work with you on a counter Iran strategy to roll back Iran in the region, pressure Iran, uh, do what we can while we build a new era of U.S. Saudi relations uh, that supports uh, MBS, as they call him, his Vision 2030 that he had rolled out, this economic vision for Saudi Arabia of moving off an oil-based economy, trying to integrate uh, into the into the region, uh, access high-tech innovation, with you know an underpinning of that really being between the lines, a path towards Israeli Saudi normalization, knowing that who is the tech center of the Middle East, who's the innovation sector of the Middle East. How can you help Middle Eastern countries like Saudi Arabia achieve innovation? You have to do that partnering with Israel. And so all of that, the security architecture being built, the economic partnership being built, put us back on a good path to restore, strengthen, and revitalize U.S.-Saudi relations uh, from a place where, where it was not good. Now, there were pitfalls in that movement there. The Trump administration did a few things that bothered Saudi Arabia. Uh, when Saudi Arabia was attacked by Iran in 2019, its oil pipelines uh, taken out by a cruise missile strike and UAV strike from Iran, there was no military response immediately. Now, there were political reasons for that that are justifiable in the United States, but to the Saudis, they sort of felt like, wait, we just got attacked. Where is the protection? Where is the United States coming to threaten militarily in our defense? That's not there. Yes, there is a maximum pressure campaign on there, but you know, what does that really mean? Is the United States willing uh, to put uh, its military might behind uh, this threat if, if it needs to? The pullout from Syria during the Trump administration, the partial pullout, again, uh, a difficult sign to the region. That, that mitigated and reversed uh, on January 2020 uh, when uh, President Trump gave the order to kill Qasem Soleimani, right? That was a major breakthrough where the Saudis, everybody in the region said, whoa, the United States is willing to use military force. We got it. Okay, we were worried there. We didn't know what was going on. Okay, and that put, put Iran on its back heels. And again, we were on a good trajectory. By the time the Trump administration left office, Iran was down to just $4 billion in foreign exchange reserves because of the maximum pressure campaign, uh, really up against the wall, fearing a credible military threat of the United States. Israel, in the meantime, had assassinated, reportedly, the uh, architect of Iran's nuclear weapons program later that year, uh, the, the most of the a day. So really a big threat picture for Iran, Saudi Arabia feeling more comfortable and on a good trajectory. Abraham Accords have just come to light towards the end of 2020 in that context. Uh, and people are talking about Saudi-Israel normalization being on a fast track. What happens next? We've talked about it in past webinars. This complete pivot back to an Obama era policy of pursuing balance between Saudi Arabia and Iran, trying to restore the Iran nuclear deal, offering to lift sanctions uh, against uh, Iran and the IRGC, uh, Iran's paramilitary terror organization. Uh, not just that, the Iranian terror proxy in Yemen that is uh, chiefly responsible for lobbing missiles almost on a daily basis and drone strikes against Saudi Arabia and the Emirates, the Houthis, which were designated uh, at the end of the Trump administration as a terrorist organization, one of the first actions by the Biden administration was to withdraw that, that terror designation. Hugely controversial uh, and a real uh, shot in the face uh, to, to the Saudi government as they're saying, well, these are the people lobbing missiles at us and you're going to lift pressure on them now without getting anything in return. All part of this sort of tried, uh, attempted reproachment with Iran following the maximum pressure campaign. Uh, within that context as well, you have obviously the political warfare of the White House against Mohammed bin Salman personally, and that takes this to a very new level. Right? It's one thing to, on a policy level, be knifing Saudi Arabia in the back. That's bad enough. But calling to make the crown prince a pariah, galvanizing the Democratic Party against Saudi Arabia, uh, declassifying information that had already been in the press to try to embarrass the crown prince further. Uh, all of these really taken on a personal level in Riyadh. 
and distancing the United States uh, from, from Saudi Arabia at critical moments. Where do we see that play out the most? Oh, there's a war between Russia and Ukraine. Gas prices are soaring. We need somebody, our great ally in Saudi Arabia, to swing oil production to try to help us. The President of the United States calls. And guess what? Apparently, when you spend a year and a half berating Saudi Arabia and trying to fund its enemies, they don't like it when you say, can you pump more gas to help us right now? Can you pump more oil to help us right now with gas prices? Uh, and so we knew that there was already a major rift at that moment. Uh, with, with Mohammed bin Salman saying, you know, go take a hike to Washington on oil, uh, that, that we needed serious work immediately to triage the U.S.-Saudi relationship before it was too late. It didn't happen. The president went to Saudi Arabia, all kinds of media around it. Of, he's not even going to shake his hand. You know, they're going to, I mean, the, the run up to the trip had made it such a terrible environment for the trip as if, you know, the president was doing Mohammed bin Salman a favor just by arriving there. Uh, and that in return for just arriving there, they should, you know, Saudis could pump more oil. Of course, the response was negative. They, they started saying, okay, well, if the U.S. is not going to be a security guarantor, they're not going to treat us as an ally and a partner. They're going to continue pursuing this failed nuclear deal approach, even though Iran is escalating its nuclear enrichment. Uh, they're escalating their sponsorship of terrorism. They're, they're supporting Russia against Ukraine. They're repressing their own people. All these things don't change anybody's mind in Washington, because don't forget, up until last fall, we were still pursuing that deal in Vienna. Uh, and so at some point, the Saudis called Beijing and said, you know, you have a relationship with Iran. Uh, what are you thinking about? What are you doing? And we've already seen in the past some footsie between Saudi Arabia and China in a, in a very dangerous way to U.S. national security, both on ballistic missile cooperation, potential civil nuclear cooperation. Those are contrary to U.S. national security interests that should already have gotten our attention long ago. To really commit to the U.S. Saudi relationship, it didn't, and we saw a historic visit to Riyadh by President Xi Jinping of China. This was in uh, December, and this trip uh, was under cover of a GCC, it's the Gulf Cooperation Council, which is the broader Gulf countries organization that Saudi Arabia basically runs uh, and hosts in Riyadh. Uh, this trip was historic in that there was a joint statement at the end of it put out between China and the GCC that basically endorsed a litany of Saudi Arabia, UAE, Gulf positions vis-a-vis -vis Iran and called for a brokering of a regional dialogue and sort of, you know, if you will, a JCPOA of the Gulf uh, where uh, they would come together to, to counter Iran ballistic missile, proliferation of missiles and drones, sponsorship of terrorism, nuclear threats, all of it delineated, just like we would talk about the threat, uh, in a Chinese agreed to document. And also even sided with the UAE in an island dispute uh, against Iran. This was shocking in Tehran. There was a lot of press reports in December, if you go back, of the Iranians protesting this joint statement, uh, had to go send a, a senior leader to Beijing, to try to pose for holy pictures to say the Iran-China relationship is, is still fine. Um, all the attention was paid to that island dispute. It wasn't on this other part of the statement about this dealing with all of Iran's threats. And so for, for, the Chinese, for the Saudis, it's like, wait, China is a great oil customer. It's their largest trading partner. They're not gonna do anything to upset the apple cart with China. And by the way, we, during the Trump administration, asked the Saudis, to sell more oil to China as we were trying to drain Iran's exports of oil. So over many years, we have always encouraged the Saudis to have a larger trading relationship with the Chinese when it benefits our interests. So we shouldn't punish them for that. Um, but they say, you know, listen, we, we know you're the ones who are keeping the Iranian regime alive right now. U.S. sanctions are in place in theory without much enforcement over the last two years. What, what is the enforcement that hasn't happened? It's this surging of uh, illicit Chinese imports of Iranian oil and other sort of development projects and infrastructure projects that the Chinese are doing for the Iranians in Iran. That is how they're paying for this oil in ways that we may not see. So you have an incredible amount of influence now 
uh, over over Tehran. Um, if you if you want to go and try to bring them to the table, listen. Rob Malley, the U.S. Special Envoy, has been forcing us to meet with the Iranians for two years, and that's true. It's been U.S. policy to try to force Saudi Arabia to normalize relations with Iran for two years under the Biden administration. And they have been conducting regular dialogues at lower levels, uh, which have largely gone nowhere. Uh, and the Saudis have concluded, we'll just go through the motions here. Everybody seems happy that we're talking to them. It looks good that we're willing to be uh, diplomatic. And the Iranians are never gonna comply with our demands. Full support from the Houthis in Yemen, stop sponsorship of terrorism, stop proliferating missiles and UAVs. Uh, stop threatening us in other ways, stop exporting radical ideologies, things like that. If they want to commit to that, sure, we'll normalize relations again. Um, so the Chinese say, no problem, we'll take care of this for you. So the Saudis have nothing to lose here, right? They, if the Chinese want to go deliver the Iranians to say yes to that deal, and all they have to do is say, okay, well, we'll, we'll reopen an embassy, which by the way, only closed in 2016. Um, and before that, they had normalized relations. By the way, the UAE has had normalized relations this entire time of the Abraham Accords, never stopped the Abraham Accords, hasn't disrupted it. Um, yeah, sure, we'll send back our ambassador, we'll do trade, all that. They're gonna have to comply with US sanctions, right? If they do anything sanctionable, the United States Treasury Department would still have to sanction any sanctionable trade, just as we've gone after UAE when we've seen sanctionable activity, which has happened. Um, so. We got nothing to lose and the world's gonna praise Mohammed bin Salman for being a peacemaker and, and whatever. And they're betting in Riyadh that the, the Iranians can't deliver, right? That they're just not gonna be able to change fundamentally all of these illicit activities. There's a two month period here for these to play out. The uh, Saudis are gonna have to see verifiable commitments. The deal, by the way, is not public. We have not seen it. We've seen various leaks and reports about it. Uh, if it ever becomes public, we'll be able to really uh, go through the details and understand exactly what uh, the Iranians have supposedly committed to. But for now, let's understand the announcement itself is absolutely a loss for the United States because the Saudis decided to go to, the, to, to Beijing to try to help them uh, curb Iranian illicit activities, not Washington. Uh, it may be a loss. Uh, for um, the United States on the Iran front, if somehow this breaks a logjam, uh, discourages the Europeans from moving to a pressure campaign on the Iranians, makes the Iranians feel somehow emboldened, um, it, it gives Iran access to uh, new uh, markets, uh, to capital, uh, maybe props up the currency that's been under tremendous amount of pressure, which we can talk about. So there's benefits to Iran saying yes at this moment as they're very cash strapped. We've seen the Rial go to historic lows in the last couple of weeks. Protests are still breaking out inside the country. Uh, there's uh, apparently reportedly alongside this, a deal on the table to get the Americans to unlock $7 billion that sits in South Korea in frozen funds uh, in exchange for the release of an American hostage. Uh, so there's all these things at play here of, of the Iranians trying their best to um, resist pressure, uh, resist the uh, ability you know, to resist the economy from collapsing. This may be a part of that, at least for the moment. The Houthis, by the way, have gone on TV stations in Lebanon and, and elsewhere to say, we're not doing that. We don't answer to Tehran. We're going to continue attacking Saudi Arabia. They can't stop us. Uh, they are a wholly owned subsidiary at this point of Tehran. So Tehran could stop them to cut off their resources, their missiles, their drones pull their IRGC trainers. That all will be verifiable and obvious to the Saudis. Uh, so let's see how this plays out. I, I, I think this is a very bad sign for US-Saudi relations. And I, I know I've talked for a while here because it's so complex, but let me just say a lot of questions you asked is how does it play out for Israel? What does this mean for this, this Wall Street Journal piece that came out just the day before that Saudi has put on the table demands from the United States to be a security guarantor and other ways of helping in exchange for normalizing relations with Israel. How does that compute with now suddenly turning to China, right? What, is, what does that mean? Well, just to understand the demands that have reportedly been put forward are some sort of a treaty type commitment uh, to Saudi Arabia, a very formal security commitment that we only give to certain countries in the world 
um, to come to their military defense if attacked and provide them with military means, uh, provide them not just civil nuclear power, but do something we don't do as US policy, which is allow the, Iran, uh, the Saudis to enrich uranium on their own soil uh, as part of that nuclear program, which creates proliferation concerns, just as we have proliferation concerns with Iran doing that on their own soil. Uh, and and some other some other items as well. Um, is is what we saw on Friday with with Iran and China, sort of the last sort of fastball right by our face, the brush pack pitch as we would say in baseball, to get our attention and say, you have one last chance here. You know, otherwise we have a permanent hedge in waiting. Do you want this relationship to be solid for another 75 years? Do you you know. What's going to happen there? So that, that's one possibility. And we can't deliver a treaty commitment to Saudi Arabia. And MBS, I think, knows that politically, we don't have the votes in the United States Senate to do that. We can design other things that meet, meet their requirements, but we can't do that. Um, we can provide them civil nuclear power and oppose an Iranian enrichment program, which we should. We can say we're done with JCPOA. We're done with Iran having a right to enrich. We're going back, we're snapping back the UN Security Council resolution, calling on Iran to halt all enrichment, having a, a military policy of, of stopping Iranian enrichment by force potentially, if necessary. But, but listen, UAE already agreed to this gold standard of no enrichment on soil over a decade ago when we did a nuclear commitment to them. We'll do the same thing for you. You can't have enrichment on your own soil. It's better to have US nuclear power anyways better than the Chinese, better than the Russians. Um, all, all of those things uh, can happen if Mohammed bin Salman wants that. I'll say one last thing, and that is, I'll turn it back. I know there's so many questions here to unpack. Even if the United States didn't provide all those guarantees and didn't come forward to Saudi Arabia, one has to question whether or not the fundamentals of why Saudi Arabia should want to normalize relations with Israel don't still stay in effect. Um, it would obviously be better for the United States to commit up front uh, to the U.S.-Saudi relationship to help broker that, just as that is what was the linchpin at Camp David in, in the 1970s for Egypt. That it remained the linchpin on, on the Jordan-Israel relationship and the U.S. commitment to Jordan. Uh, it remains part of how we got the UAE and Bahrain onto the Abraham Accord, so it makes sense. But if the only country in the entire world that will ever actually have Saudi Arabia's back against Iran is ultimately Israel, because the US may not want to use military power, they may be in a JCPOA mindset. Uh, China is playing both sides, you know, helping uh, support Iran's economy, uh, missile parts, UAV parts, strategic relations there. Uh, so the Saudis know they can't fully trust the Chinese ever, they're still playing both sides. Uh, who are they going to look to for security relationships for, for their entire future? It's Israel. That remains true. And if they are serious about Vision 2030, they're not going to get there on just Chinese support. They need the tech, innovation, genius, and Middle East network uh, out of Israel to get that done. So the fundamentals of, of Saudi-Israel normalization remain. This is a stumbling block. Um, but no matter what, for U.S. interests, for great power competition, for Saudi as a normalization, for Iran's threat to the region, this is absolutely a moment to re-engage heavily, seriously on these demands, and see if this relationship can be salvaged with the condition that, listen, China is not your security guarantor. You can't have a military relationship there. You can't have a nuclear relationship there. What's it going to take to make sure we're with you and you're with us? All right, I'll stop there. Plenty of follow -up. It's like the old adage, um, even if one wants to turn its back on the Middle East, the Middle East has a way of coming back to you. So, um, so in terms of issues of trust, I know that both the United States and Israel are um, in CENTCOM with Saudi Arabia. Um, how can we rely on the Saudis now that some of our vital security information doesn't make its way back to Beijing or to Tehran? 
Yeah, listen, the, the, the Saudi-Chinese relationship is not new, right? So as I said, they, they are a very close trading partner. It's, it's their top trading partner, um, as, as the Saudis will let you know uh, in meetings. Um, they have had a past uh, reported relationship uh, in the missile realm, potentially in the future in the nuclear realm. Um, and so you, you do have to always understand that countries that have closer relationships with China, um, we in the United States have to safeguard information and technology and understand what technology can be provided, what can't. And there are strings attached to military platforms that we provide, uh, other types of intelligence support that we provide, that it cannot, it cannot be shared with Beijing, it cannot be shared with Moscow. There are only a limited number of countries in the world that get access to this kind of technology. And if we ever find that to be violated, that can permanently freeze the relationship strategically. Remember, this happened to Israel once upon a time. People may not remember. We're coming up on almost 20 years from this, 18 years. is When I arrived in Washington, first full year as a staffer in Washington, we had the, the total fallout of U.S.-Israel defense relations uh, over China, where the Pentagon froze U.S.-Israel strategic relations. It was bad. Um, at the time, very quietly, my old boss was playing shuttle diplomacy in Israel on the ground between the Pentagon and Israel's MOD, trying to figure out how to unfreeze things. Israel made a lot of commitments, a lot of upgrades to its export controls, uh, fired key personnel uh, responsible for that relationship. Uh, and uh, the Pentagon then uh, renewed its uh, relationship on F-35 joint strike fighter planning, the strategic dialogues, et cetera. Um, so we take this very, very, very seriously in Washington. If we are willing to freeze Israel's relationship over, over China, uh, you can bet we would do that to any other country in the world. So, um, so yes, that, that's something to be taken in, in, into consideration of. Uh, I will say a couple of things. One, we touched on this a little bit. It's important to understand where Iran's nuclear program is today. Uh, we understand that they have uh, the IAEA has detected 84% enriched uranium being produced uh, at the underground uh, facility at Fordo. Um, they have two facilities where they are enriching uranium, uh, a, a mostly above ground facility, though they are trying to build out an underground area at Natan, and then the underground, the mountain one outside Colm in a, a place called Fordo. Uh, what had happened was in January, uh, the IAEA learned that unbeknownst to them, without declaration, already a violation of the NPT, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, Iran had reconfigured its centrifuge cascade at Fordo in a manner that many experts suspect is to be used to have the capability to produce weapons-grade uranium for the first time. And in perhaps experimenting and testing and trying to figure out how exactly to do that, or even perhaps how to produce some material that could be siphoned off without the IAEA even seeing. Uh, the IAEA came for a snap inspection once they learned about the reconfiguration, tested what was being produced and found 84% material. The Iranians to this day are not explaining how that's possible. We know there's really only one explanation for that. The stockpiles of 60% high enriched uranium, plus their stockpiles of 20% high enriched uranium, uh, just on the 60% alone, they have enough nuclear material now, if they wanted to, to produce one bomb's worth within 12 days, put together all their high enriched uranium and a massive low enriched uranium stockpile, they could be producing five, four or five or six in just a month or more. And so on the enrichment path, we are basically at that 90% weapons grade uranium threshold. The Iranians are signaling to us the enrichment path, this breakout timeline we had always feared in the past, it's in the rear view mirror. Breakout is at zero right now. Breakout is defined as the amount of time it would take to produce enough weapons grade uranium for one nuclear bomb. We're at 12 days, we're at effective zero uh, on, on the breakout. Why haven't we seen a military strike? You know, for a long time, everybody believed 90% may be a military red line. A breakout of zero would be a, a military red line. We have now changed the dynamic uh, of what we are looking at in Iran's nuclear program in the United States from breakout to weaponization. That is now how the Biden administration is grading the threat and when there would need to be actions. 
It may also be how the Israelis are looking at it as well, though their timeline based on their military capabilities may be different than ours. And so, and so that explains what everybody's probably wondering, like, well, 84% weapons grade way. Are we about to have military action? No, we're looking at weaponization. There's a danger to that because as we've seen in the past, you don't always know when they're weaponizing. You think you know, you hope you know, but you may not know. What they are enriching in front of us, we can see, we know. The different aspects of weaponization, you may not always know. One other very worrying part. There continues to be a lack of international inspection and verification at the place where they manufacture centrifuges, especially these advanced centrifuges. And they have been adding centrifuges left and right, according to the last IAEA report. We don't know if they are old ones from before the JCPOA, new ones from centrifuge manufacturing, but there are tons coming out. And we don't know where they're going from that facility, where they're being diverted to, where manufacturing equipment may be moving to. They could be setting up clandestine manufacturing sites and producing centrifuges we don't know about. That's a very worrying capability. And the IEA has told us at this point, we will never be able to verify what they have been doing for the last year at this, at this manufacturing site, almost a year. And so you put that picture together, there could be a military strike ne necessary, if not by the United States, then by Israel. And that could happen in different ways. And it could happen soon, we don't know. Um, and so the question has always been, what does this Saudi-Iran relationship mean for an Israeli military strike? There's been this assumption that perhaps Saudi Arabia uh, wanting to see Iran's nuclear program destroyed as well would give Israel clandestine uh, access to its airspace, maybe even land in the desert to refuel as part of any aerial campaign that was needed in the other pieces that, that come together uh, as part of Israel's plan. And that now if they've normalized, it's not possible. Israel's plan is out the window. There's no possibility now of an Israeli military strike. I have seen very, very smart people, like very smart people who have issued analyses that say it's almost impossible now to imagine an Israeli military strike because of this announcement. That is not true. Um, if Saudi Arabia, were to give Israel access to airspace, access to landing rights, uh, or in any other way provide material support to an Israeli military strike on Iran, regardless of if it had normalized relations with Iran or not, in a way that Iran would be able to, at some point to suspect or know, the Saudis would expect and I think we should all expect Iran would retaliate against Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is very much in the mode right now, clearly, of not wanting to be attacked by Iran because nobody's coming to their defense. Not Washington, not Beijing. The IAF is not going to sit there and defend uh, Saudi Arabia while they got Hezbollah retaliating on their northern border and Hamas launching rockets and still having to try to make sure they got everything in Iran. Uh, so. From a Saudi perspective, this announcement is completely separate from any calculation on supporting an Israeli strike on Iran. We should already assume they've said no, if they were going to say no, for fear of retaliation. And anything that they are okay providing, they'll be okay providing even with normalized relations, because they probably are making a calculation that the Iranians will never be able to prove they did that. And so let's think of an Israeli strike, not as, well, how do they go across Saudi Arabia, but what are all the different pieces of a strike might look like, the cyber pieces, the sabotage pieces. We just saw a drone strike in recent weeks inside Iran, launched from inside Iran, likely by Israel. We've seen reports of other uh, Israeli operations launched from Northern Iraq. We know that the border with Azerbaijan is porous and potentially was used in past Mossad operations. So put all of those pieces together, plus the potential to maybe need somewhere to have planes refueling uh, or landing, maybe not, depending on what the target set is. Uh, let's, let's try to put that piece of it aside from the Saudi-Iran deal, because I really don't think it's connected. All right, all right. Wow, it is not just playing chess, it's playing 12-dimensional chess. There are so many. Okay. Um, during the negotiations for the JCPOA, we were promised over and over again swift snapback sanctions if Iran ever violates the deal. 
What are the prospects of Europe triggering snapback sanctions? Do you think it even enters their calculus that Iran is providing Russia with drones for them to use in their immoral war against Ukraine? I think so. I think this is the tension going on, and this is the one piece of the Saudi-Iran deal that worries me if it were actually to come to fruition and move forward. Um, anything that in some way uh, makes Europe or Washington hesitate about that snapback is bad. And anything that gives momentum to the idea of, oh, well, if the Saudis can normalize, maybe we should reconsider JCPOA as well and let's you know, put a new nuclear deal back on the table. We shouldn't snap back. That'll provoke Iran. We have diplomacy now. Let's latch on to Saudi diplomacy. We'll see what else other momentum. Is. There might be a hostage deal. This could be a breakthrough as well. Um, so, so that's the only reason why I said that. Why do we need snapback? We need snapback for a host of reasons. Number one, the Iran nuclear deal, the sunset provisions of the deal, we recall, the first one in 2020 on the arms embargo going away. By the way, how is Russia able to promise to sell the Su-35 fighter jet to Iran that we're very worried about right now? Under international law, legal, because we allowed uh, the arms embargo on Iran, the conventional arms embargo on Iran to expire in 2020. If we snap back, that transfer becomes illegal under international law, and not just the United States can try to use its own sanctions and, and potential military actions to try to stop it, but others may be encouraged to do so as well citing a UN Security Council resolution. Uh, what else has happened under those sunsets? Well, this October, this October, the next one comes, and that has to do with missiles and UAVs. And so if you're worried about Iran's support to Russia and Ukraine and the transfer of even more advanced drones and short-range ballistic missiles, potentially, to Russia, uh, you don't want that international restriction to lift whether you view it as symbolic or forceful of, of multilateralism, as the Biden administration claims that you always is for multilateralism, uh, then you should want that restriction to stay in place. The only way to keep that restriction in place is to snap back before it expires later this year. And by the way, all of the other aspects of Iran's nuclear program that we are all saying is outrageous. Oh, they're enriching this high. They're using this advanced centrifuges. They're using these facilities all allowed as you go through the sunset, right? By 2031, Iran's allowed to enrich weapons grade uranium as much as they want. They just can't build the bomb. That's the only commitment they make long-term. So it makes no sense at this point that Iran has already sort of fast forward its capability to 2031, essentially. Uh, but we're gonna sit here paying Iran from 2023 until 2031, while all of these sunsets continue to fall off, all the strategic sunsets have already expired. And by the way, the resuscitation or the hope to resuscitate an Iran nuclear deal continues to be something that lifts up just a little bit that Iranian economy and that Iranian real and keeps the financial system from total collapse for the regime. If you snap back, it is pro-Ukraine, it is pro the people of Iran, it is finally cracking down and holding them accountable for their illicit nuclear program. It's restoring the international principle of zero enrichment in, in Iran, which helps us in our negotiations, as I mentioned, with Saudi Arabia. Uh, and it puts us back in a multilateral perspective of how are we going to deal with this threat long term. We're not going to be continuing down a rabbit hole of just negotiating with Iran, an extortion racket of how much money do you want in exchange for what? Limited concessions will you give us today on your nuclear program while you take that money and fund it for terrorism and missiles and human rights abuses and hostage taking and the rest. We need a new strategy. It starts with snapback, which resets the clock, resets the table, restores all the international restrictions, and then says we are going to impose maximum sanctions on the regime to cut off its access to resources for terrorism and missiles and everything else that it threatens the United States with and our allies. And we will use a credible threat of military force, either from the United States or the United States providing the assistance Israel needs to do it, to deter and if, and if necessary, degrade or remove the threat from its nuclear program. We can no longer view the nuclear threat 
as someone we can deal with with sanctions. Sanctions as part of a comprehensive strategy are helpful to undermine the regime, squeeze the regime, roll back the regime, contain the regime, whatever word you want to use. They are not going to solve the nuclear threat at this time unless the regime collapses quickly. Uh, and so we need to move to a pressure and deter strategy. That's what I call it. Pressure the regime in all the other areas of malign activities and deter from acquiring a nuclear weapon and potentially taking action to remove the threat. Brilliant. Um, now it's my honor to um, turn the podium over to my esteemed colleague, Hussein Abubakar Mastsour, who will read some of the questions that have come in and perhaps pose some of his own. Hussein? Thank you very much, Sarah, and thank you very much, Richard, for uh, such a timely presentation. And thank you very much for all our audience who tuned in uh, to listen to us today and who sent us questions. Um, thank you very much. We have only 15 minutes, so I'm pretty sure that we're not going to have uh, the time we need to go through all the questions. So I'm going to try to do my best in order to combine as many uh, of them. Um, Richard, we've received the action many times, people asking and wondering, they are not entirely sure what exactly the Trump sanctions, the multiple pressure, uh, the, the maximum pressure campaign was able to achieve. So the question is, what did those sa sanctions actually achieve? achieve? So what is the goal of, of sanctions pressure? Um, in, in the case of small little sanctions being put on, it could be to try to induce behavioral change. Um, we've seen sort of the threat of sanctions in a targeted way uh, against a state actor like Turkey used to temporarily destabilize um, the Turkish uh, economy, the Turkish currency, uh, the lira in order to get um, a uh, U.S. hostage out, remember Pastor Brunson's case. And so um, that was an interesting test case of a use of sanctions in a very siloed way for one behavioral purpose. Maximum pressure uh, is a very different use case for sanctions. It's more akin to the Cold War strategy of using economic warfare as part of a whole of government multi-spectrum approach to pressure roll back contain a state actor. And so the point of sanctions is to say, are we better off in US national security doing our best to deny the IRGC resources or should we allow them free access to resources? If sanctions can reduce the budget of the IRGC and the coup force, if they can dry up money for the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism, if it can make it harder for the regime to access key technologies, uh, import things they need to continue to perfect their missile program, their drone program, et cetera, is that good for US national security? Even if it doesn't immediately collapse the regime, it doesn't stop the action immediately, is that good or bad? And the answer I have is a a, an Islamic Republic of Iran with less money is good for US national security. It is not the only way that we need to go about trying to undermine the regime. We need to combine that with political warfare, isolating them in the UN, international bodies, the SNAP Act is a part of that, calling security council meetings to put a light on all the horrors that they're doing. In some ways they're helping us more than ever before, shining a light on, on the true nature of the regime, both with the repression of women uh, and minorities in Iran and their support to Russia. We should be shining a laser beam on that every single day um, to undermine the regime, uh, broadcasting su maximum support to the people of Iran uh, in various ways, technology, resources, helping them organize, get access to information uh, to undermine the regime. Uh, and of course, covert activities that we don't talk about and military deterrence. Those put together is actually how we won the Cold War in the 1980s. Uh, and so uh, it's not like we just, you know, pulled this idea out of nowhere. There's an entire book about this called Victory uh, by Peter Schweitzer that I encourage everybody to read. Um, so what did we accomplish? Well, uh, the regime was back on its heels. It was down to $4 billion in foreign exchange reserves accessible um, by the end of the Trump administration. They had lost their top commander of terrorism and were confused in the IRGC coup force. Their relationships were suffering in the region because of the loss of Soleimani and resources drying up to those proxies because of the lack of money. Um, they had actually uh, finally started impeding uh, some of their missile uh, R&D. Uh, covert action by the Israelis had picked up. 
um, in coordination and empowered by uh, U.S. maximum pressure, which was again uh, creating a deterrence and chilling effect on their nuclear program and elsewhere. Uh, so put together, this was a regime that was up against the wall, in my view, coming into 2021. And it's not until we relax that maximum pressure campaign that you see Iran go from low enriched uranium to high enriched uranium, that you see Iran start escalating its attacks on U.S. troops in Iraq and Syria, uh, that you see uh, continued uh, missile proliferation uh, and other threats uh, against uh, the United States. Uh, we haven't had a prisoner exchange since maximum pressure. Uh, we didn't have to pay to get our hostages out of Iran. Uh, we actually were able to arrange prisoner exchanges. So uh, I think there was a lot of benefits you can see to maximum pressure. You can see all the pitfalls, Abraham Accords, uh, by the way, a, a byproduct of that maximum pressure well, changing the strategic dynamic of the Middle East, understanding that great power competition is already happening in the Middle East and that we can't just say we're going to leave the region and, and, and go to Asia, as if Asia was not already in the Middle East, as we just learned on Friday. So I think there's a lot of reasons why maximum pressure was the right policy. It may have been in its uh, form by the Trump administration an incomplete policy. Um, it also unfortunately suffered from the fact that our European allies did not like Donald Trump. And we were at loggerheads uh, with Europe and our, and our traditional allies over JCPOA. Uh, and, it, and it's difficult to get past that hump. The, the JCPOA was a historic, tragic mistake of epic proportions that we're still paying for today. Uh, just on top of other uh, tragic mistakes, the precipitous withdrawal from Iraq in 2011, not enforcing the red line, uh, et cetera. So we were on a path to repair those relationships, uh, creating new strategic paradigm for, for the Middle East long term, the integration of Arab uh, and, and Israelis. Uh, to be able to be, take responsibility for themselves, which actually does re reduce military pressure on us, and draining this regime of resources, rolling them out of their comfort zone, uh, reducing their support to proxies, all of that. Um, we can restore that. It's possible. It just takes a lot of work. Um, thank you. Well, actually, following up on exactly this point, there are a few questions here that are asking about uh, Israel's uh, uh, isolation. So as you said, the Abraham Accords were basically a product of a, a, a different strategies that were created by, by the Trump administration um, that really created an incentive and, uh, and really a desire for Arabs to normalize with Israel. Um, now we're looking at news. Israel, uh, Iran now has, instead of 12 years, a, a, to a breakout time, you have only 12 days to a breakout time. You have the uh, the, the the Chinese entering a Middle Eastern diplomacy with with this a uh, kind of deal. You have also a, a some political uh, drama in Israel that might be really undermining the confidence of a lot of people in the Israeli political system. And you do have a, a U.S. administration uh, that doesn't seem to be as committed uh, uh, to the traditional U.S. allies um, and, and positions in the Middle East. Doesn't doesn't this create uh, a, a new situation in which the incentive is the opposite than it was three years ago? An incentive towards isolating Israel and getting away from Israel. Yeah, I think the fundamentals, as I said, still are overwhelmingly in favor of Arab-Israeli integration from an economic and strategic perspective. Um, I think that uh, it was still a Prime Minister Netanyahu with right-wing policies that uh, normalized with the UAE and Bahrain. Uh, so the idea that you know you, you needed Lapid or you know Tali Bennett to be able to have the Abraham Accords. It doesn't make sense to me because obviously we didn't get a single country added to the Abraham Accords uh, during the Bennett Lapid government. Um, we only had the Abraham Accords and some follow on countries quickly uh, while Netanyahu was previously prime minister. That said, the instability in Israel is not helpful to Israel. Uh, I don't think anybody would disagree with that. That is not to assign blame to, to one part or the other. Um, I think there's plenty of blame to be going around right now. Uh, the sooner there can be a compromise, clearly the better. Um, and you know, even the leading advocates for judicial reform, like Kohelet, are already urging a compromise and saying get rid of the you know, judicial override proposal, things like that. So there's obviously a clamoring for for getting the upheaval behind Israel. It's not helpful to any relationship in the world when a country is in political upheaval. It's a democracy. They're going through a, a major democratic moment, um, and and we have to respect. 
that process uh, and hope it comes out well. Um, but in the end, the things that would probably be undermining would be more uh, rhetoric from certain members of the government. Um, that's the kind of stuff that I think uh, can, be, can be unhelpful to the environment for normalization. Remember, Saudi Arabia is still the crown jewel. Uh, you're talking about the home of Mecca. Um, to, to have Saudi Arabia normalized with Israel without a Palestinian state is an enormous, an enormous challenge in and of itself, which may be surmountable, but not with toxicity in the language used um, by sitting ministers um, that could be revved up in the Arab world and the press really trigger a lot of emotions. Uh, and so I, I think that it's possible that given the short-term inability right now to work on normalization because of that environment in Israel, there's an added incentive for the Saudis to say, what do we have to lose to go two months and see what the Chinese do? Could be one more ingredient there of sort of the calculus. But long-term, assuming that this chaos in Israel can calm down, and assuming that a democracy can, can move through this at some point, um, and tensions are lowered and language is modified uh, to be responsible, you would think that the fundamentals I described on both the security side for Iran and Islamic extremism, the Muslim Brotherhood we didn't talk about, Saudi Arabia still uh, is very much at war with the Muslim Brotherhood and its factions, as is Israel, you're talking about Hamas and, and other uh, Islamic parties. Um, so all the reasons to, to have that integration, Vision 2030, tech, uh, high tech innovation are all still there long term. Thank you. Um, there are news reports that uh, President Xi is preparing for a diplomatic a, a, uh, round between Russia and Ukraine um, in the near future. Uh, it, will this in any way be affected by the recent Chinese success in the in the Middle East? And will it also um, influence or take the, the Chinese Iranian relationship as leverage? I don't know. I think this is, this is more uh, the Chinese um, with some sort of a play that that Putin probably wants. Um, I think we should not mistake the Chinese-Russian relationship as anything other than a very close one, where at least for now the interests are tightly aligned, and she sees Putin's victory and and dragging out the Americans there uh, and potentially defeating Ukraine as very important uh, to his long-term uh, plan uh, towards Taiwan. Uh, we've seen reports of potential security, increased cooperation, military support, et cetera. There's obviously an economic relationship that's ongoing. Um, and we've seen reports of just, you know, a, a rhetorical commitment, uh, political commitment of support from Xi to Putin directly. Um, so whatever this is, um, you know, I, I would say it's likely in Putin's favor. Um, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll watch it closely, whether it has to do with them feeling big that they brokered something in the Middle East. Uh, I, I don't know if that's, if I would say that this is still sort of Russia's AOR as their area of responsibility. This is Putin's, this is Putin's war, uh, and his, um, vision of Russia on the line. Uh, so whatever she is, is offering here and doing here would only be done if, if Putin consents. Thank you, Richard. The last question that, that I'm going to ask you is um, about a, the possibility of an Israeli um, airstrike on the Iranian uh, nuclear program. Um, how close are we to a point where Israel uh, uh, must act or will have to act against the, the Iranian nuclear program? Um, and how much support do we expect Israel to have from the United States and uh, other Arab countries in case uh, Israel attacks the nuclear program? Well, so there's a couple of timelines that, that we're obviously watching. One is the actual threat timeline. And we don't have full access to intelligence that, that folks with clearances do. We don't know what the Israelis have access to and what they're watching. Uh, and so we imagine that there are some set of criteria, some indications and warnings that they have that if they see anything happening in certain areas, they believe that is their, their moment to have to act. Uh, there's preparations for something. Now, that may not be putting a bomb together. That may be moving things out of sight, diverting things, preparing alternative sites, right? The dispersion of the program would be uh, an existential threat because so long as things that are most critical to the program are in a place that you know, you can hit that place or you can sabotage that place. 
when it is moved in places that you don't know, then you have a real problem on your hands. Um, so, so that's one piece of it. If they ever actually had weaponization intelligence, you would imagine that's another piece as well, but it doesn't have to be that. It could be something short of that. We don't know that. The other piece is the capability piece. Right? We have to assume that Israelis have various contingency plans for different moments of their capabilities and what they think they can hit and how, they, how they're going to hit it. I would say, you know, we would all agree that the Israelis have been the most creative military and intelligence service on the planet in history um, over many, many, many uh, operations that we've seen that have defied um, ability and logic and technology that we thought of. Uh, and so let's not assume we know exactly how Israel is going to do this, right? Uh, when you read the New York Times about some AI machine gun inside Iran that, you know, with a, with a car and all this, so how they got most of them for day, like, this is stuff that nobody, like, thinks about. A, a drone that launched inside Iran against a secret Iranian facility. I mean, this stuff starting to, like, it's stuff from movies, right? That, that, that's what the Israelis are made of. So... Uh, we obviously have a timeline in the future of potential deliveries of updated F-15s that would be far more advanced for them, uh, far more advanced, sophisticated uh, refueling air-to-air -air tankers uh, from the United States, uh, other larger munitions that could come with those updated aircraft um, that might be larger bunker busters to actually get at um, the Fordo facility. But again, let's not assume we know everything that, that they're capable of and that they're thinking of how to use their capabilities towards facilities. We have a one, you know, our way of how we would envision that attack in Fordo or elsewhere, that might not be what their plan is. And therefore, if they can delay the program to 2025 to take delivery of other things, that might make an operation easier or different. If they have, based on intelligence, the need to go in 2023, I think they're going to figure out how to do it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Hussein, and thank you um, immensely, Richard, um, for your clear, coherent, concise, and cogent analysis of the ongoing situation and all of the, the swiftly moving dynamics and factors that go into this um, multidimensional chessboard of the Middle East. Um, I, it is always a pleasure and an honor to work with you, Rich, and to all of the wonderful people over at FDD. Um, and I would also, I, I have been reminded that I have to put in a plug Please support FDD. And also, if you like what we do at EMET, I think it's really important that you support EMET um, in a world of you know, misinformation, um, radically changing information from day to day. Our members of Congress have grown to depend on us, trust us, and rely on us in order to keep them up to date um, with valuable facts, um, which we do every day on Capitol Hill. So if you can, please support both FDD.org and AmetOnline.org so we can continue this very, very valuable work. And we will see you um, once again next week where will we, where will we be talking to Ambassador Yoram Ettinger who will have a, a different perspective from Israel on all of this. Thanks again for joining us to everybody in our studio audience. Be well, bye-bye.